everybody. Daryl Vera back with Michael Todd talking about XGen. This is our third installment in the Vision series. And we're going to be talking about XGen and archives. And we're going to be going through some basic stuff, some sort of 101 things. And since Michael's here, he can kind of give us the why, why, why certain things are the way they are. And then we'll talk about some shading stuff as well as just some, some kind of crazy stuff toward the end and doing animation with archives and things like that. So in this example, what we have here is we've got a piece of geometry that we want to instance across this ground plane. So the first step in doing that is generating the archives. Right. And when you generate archives inside of um, XGen, you have a couple different options when you're exporting these out. You can export out animation as well as have it automatically um, make levels of detail so that the background objects obviously aren't as high res as the foreground objects. You're not paying for that penalty of that high poly count on things that maybe you're only filling two, three pixels on screen. One thing that um, and I, I, I find is that I like to pre-test my objects on that poly reduce to make sure that it actually can poly reduce without erroring out first. So this is really easy to do inside of Maya. Just grab the piece of geometry, jump over to your mesh command, and say edit mesh. I'm sorry, go to mesh and just say poly reduce and just make sure that that poly reduce command does run and execute on it so that you know that the XGen tool is going to be calling that, same, same, tool. that same tool, right? So to generate the archives, just go to the modeling section, jump up to generate, say export, we've got to have it selected there, say export selection as uh, an XGen archive. So when you bring that up, you can give it a name, obviously, you can turn on the automatic poly reduction and if you want to, you can also turn on the animation and specify a range, and in this example, it would be one to frame 15. So you basically say export, XGen goes out and builds a bunch of files that it works with. Some of them are for loading up the preview inside of viewport 2.0, and others are going to be referenced by the render or called at the render or during render time. Yeah, this is uh, render instances and uh, obviously Alembic cache for the viewport. So you can see that we had a little bit of animation on this that we'll be, we'll be using a bit later in the presentation. So I've already gone through and exported out these archives. So now what we want to do is we want to begin to instance this piece of geometry across this ground plane. And if we display our grid, this is pretty, pretty typical, you'll notice that that, that, you know, that ground plane is very, very large. So if I start to add this on as an instance geometry, often you'll find if you have a large scale and you're seeing, you can't get that density value low enough, right? Like you put yeah. it to 0.005 and it's still just incredibly dense. So how do you work around that, and why, why is that? What's going on here? Uh, well, because density is uh, primitives per unit area, and regardless of the scale of the object or if it's been transformed, uh, XGen still calculates it uh, in the in world space of centimeters. So uh, a trick to get around that is to scale the terrain down, make a copy of the terrain and use a blend chip maybe to scale it back up again, but scale it down uh, a known amount, and then bind XGen to that and set it up that way, and then you can scale it back up to, the, right. to the correct size, and then XGen will actually calculate it at the, the, the smaller size, so right. you so don't get a really high density. We go ahead and we freeze transforms on this guy, and we do our binding. So we're going to say XGen, and in this example, again, we're going to be using custom geometry, and we're going to place those using expression. So we'll go ahead and we'll create that. And then now, once that has been bound, we can jump back and scale this guy back up. Oops, looks like I've got to go to 10, not 100. So we get that back to its original shape. So now when we jump into XGen, I still like to drop this density value down low because when you, as soon as you load that archive, it, it, you know, if you have auto preview turned on, yeah. it's going to try to flood it. And if, you, you know, if you're trying to flood a billion things, it doesn't matter how powerful your hardware is, you're, you're going to... Uh, well, you, you, there's another thing you could do when you the preview output. You could actually drop the preview output density so it actually doesn't show. And it's actually got a limit on the number of primitives that you can... Oh, add. very cool, very cool. So awesome you, you can set that down to a thousand, and it will only generate a thousand primitives regardless. regardless of what your setting is. Yeah. I love that. Very cool. All right, so let's go ahead and um, grab that sunflower. We'll open that guy up. Of course, we want to bring those shaders in because that's good. And you can see that, you know, it's got a few sunflowers in there. So now we can start to put this up, maybe to point one, or maybe even to a value of one. And you can see that our slider is is going to work in a, in a nice, realistic way. And we also included in the export when I did this, when I set this up the LOD, so if we kind of, let's just get this a little bit higher, maybe three or something like that. We can start to play around with these clip values on those LODs to start to load in lower res versions of this. So as, as I start- the, Drop them a uh, lower distance, yeah. Yeah, you drop them down to a lower distance, and if we zoom in on this guy, you can see if I start to pull that back, there goes the high res object right there, so. So you, you want the high res one up close to the camera, but you know, further away you can go to the medium, and then further away it goes to the LOD. Uh, the low level, the lowest level one. So we'll kind of push that lower level one back a little bit. So and we've that got reduces the poly count and the pressure on the viewport display. 
Awesome. So now that we've got these in here, you know, this is great, but they, they look a little random. They look a little uniform. They don't look random enough. There, there's no randomness in here, and yeah. that, that is an issue. Yeah. So let's go ahead and start making some expressions. So we, we've obviously got the ability to adjust the length, the width, and the depth of these guys. I actually don't want to dial those in independently. I don't want random length, no. width, and depth. I want them all to kind of scale uniformly. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an expression that's going to be a float that's going to just be you know, my, own, my own value, right? Yeah, it can be a, uh, a random, and you can have set minimum, max on sliders and stuff like that. So you can actually play with that. And then that, evaluate, that expression will only be evaluated once and then that, the result will be passed through to wherever you call that expression. Right, so we're gonna to wanna to write an expression on this. And I, I, like I said before, I always like to save my expressions out. So I've got an expression that I saved out that's just a random number generator. And I actually made it also just make a couple sliders for me. So it, you know, basically we're defining dollar sign min, dollar sign max. We're saying A is equal to a random number generator based on the values that we set with our min and the max. So yeah. it's a really simple little expression. It's one that I use all the time, so I just make sure that I, I have that guy saved out. So now, if we go and we reference in this new, this new float DTO, yeah. it's, it's going to be queryable throughout XGen now, right? Yeah, and it's also it evaluates faster because it's not going through length and evaluating it, width and evaluating it, and then depth and evaluating it. It just evaluates it once, and then that value is... So yeah. what do I need to do here? Do I just need to say dollar sign $A is equal to DTO, and that's it? Uh, you know, you can just get rid of all of that. Okay. And, just, and put, just DTO and open close bracket. So that's going to hold the random number. Yeah, and if you if you click there, you can see the. Oh uh, yes, I love that. So clicking you get in that a little swatch, preview, yeah. that preview, gives you, that gives you a preview of the uh, an update of the preview. So we can just go ahead and paste this in here, and we'll grab it for the depth also. So now, if we jump back, we've got sliders that allow us to really kind of you know, play around with this stuff in, in, a, in a little bit higher level and start to get this nice random... And random. then you could uh, add randomization to the uh, around normal The, the well. rotate or... Yeah. So the next thing that we might want to do is we might want to randomize the color of these, right? So right. It's, it's cool that I've got some sunflowers in here, but it's not cool They're that everyone exactly is the exactly color. the same. So there's a couple different approaches to this, and, and one of the ways it's actually really pretty awesome is you can layer... Um, no, Maya's procedural nodes on top of this, the shading nodes directly on top of this. So let's go ahead and ch check out an example of that. So if we bring up the hypershade for this, and we grab this sunflower right here, we'll graph that guy in here. So we've got this, this texture map on here, right? And if we go to the attributes for this texture map, and we start to play around with something like the, the color gain here, you can see that obviously that, that makes it darker, except for that one. That's the, the one That's that the we original. didn't export. That's the original. So we want to we want to modulate those those uh, those sunflowers based on just changing that color game, right? So you think, all right, well that's that's cool. Let me just texture map into this guy something like, I don't know, a checker. And the problem with that is that's going to happen in UV space, right? So yeah. That's not really the it's way I want to do exactly the same thing as the, the original version, which is going to be, they're all the same. They're all getting the same effect applied to them. Right. So to, to not have it happen in UV space, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to modulate that by using a solid. And this is, this is so cool that, that XGen does this. And it works both in the viewport and in the renderer. So instead of modulating that with, in the UV space, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just click the color, color gain button one more time. And we'll grab a 3D texture, and I'll grab something that's really easy to see, like um, solid fractal. So we'll, we'll map that solid fractal to that guy. So now, this this is actually, you know, you can see that, you know, very clearly, you know, that flower has got a different texture than that flower. And to, to overdrive this and really make it a little bit more apparent to what's going on, we'll just crank that amplitude up to something like six, and then I'll just go down here to the filter, which is um, this is basically going to kind of blur that out. But you can see that, you know, we've got that 3D texture now really changing and, and driving the overall color of those guys. And obviously, because it's a 3D texture, you know, we can adjust the size or the scale of that. So it gives us the ability to extremely quickly start to, to introduce in a level of kind of variation or, or randomness to the color of yeah. these also. And that Super will work powerful. in the render as well. So what you're seeing in the viewport is what you're going to get in the render. Excellent, excellent. All right, so let's jump over to the next example. All right, so next we want to go ahead and we want to add um, some, some randomness to the movement of this. So we've got, we've got our sunflowers. We want to have them kind of each individually moving a little bit. So there's a couple different ways of approaching this. The first way is really, really simple to do, and that's using a modifier to yep. add in wind. wind. Yep. So let's go ahead and check that out. 
So we jump over to the modifiers for the archives, click the Add button, and somewhere in here is a wind. So we go ahead and we add that wind on there. And what, what's the wind actually doing? You can see, well, they're, they're blowing. What's going on with that? So uh, you might want to go down and turn on loopable wind as well. OK. So I'm going to open that section up. Let's expand that guy out. So what this does, loopable. it doesn't deform the uh, archive objects because they're instances. So if they were being deformed, they would have to be actual geometry in my own. That would have you increase the memory footprint a lot and uh, reduce the performance. So what this does, it actually takes the the primitives and actually just rotates them around the base with the pivot point of the original object. So it actually just creates this motion which looks like uh, they're, they're blowing in the wind, but they're actually just kind of ro rotating a little bit around the base. Nice. Looks looks really gives it just gives it a little subtle. Just subtle gives it a keep alive kind of thing, and what it's just like they're not just completely static and motionless. Okay, and you can see I've got this one this one little guy back here. That was the original guy that we exported out. If we rewind this, and you can see him him deforming and bending back. So if you know if you do have deformation based animation on your archives, yep. you can bring those guys in too and, and play around with those. So let's yep. let's look at an example of that. So I've loaded up um, a simplified version of the scene here that's just got a few of these sunflowers in there. And if we go, jump over to the primitives and grab this frame number and start to, start to scrub through it, you can see that you know, there, there's the de deforming animation that was saved out in, in the archive, right? So we could use a random kind of number generator to cycle through those frame ranges yeah. randomly for each one. Or what I wanted to do was actually have a texture map drive that and have where black was be frame zero and where white was be frame 15. And one of those, uh, one of those moments where I call Michael and say, hey, man, how do you do this? And he's like, uh, I'll figure it out. And eventually. Eventually. So we, we got it figured out. And it's actually pretty cool. And it's, it's not super fast. Like once it starts loading everything, it, it does take some time yeah, to, to it, cache it all in. You have to it load works. a, because you've got a, a cache per frame for each instance. And if they're all loading a different frame, they have to load each cache for that one. So that can slow the, the, the refresh rate down. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to just add in a, a global expression that's just going to give us a float number that's going to give us this, this texture map, essentially. Yeah. And then we're going to take that information and we're going to remap that information into the frame number. Yeah, it's a procedural generated uh, texture rather than a texture image. Right, so we'll do float and we'll just call it, I think it was called ramp. What was it called, ramp map? or Frame, frame map? Yeah, I think we frame called map. it frame map when we, when we read frame map. So we'll make this uh, this global frame map. And to that, you know, I'm going to load up an expression. And you know, you can go into the expression editor here and you could start going through some of these samples. And if you jump into the samples and you go into procedural, so you go color, procedural. And inside of procedural there's there's a whole whole bunch of these guys. So there's these cool noises. And you know, they just start making these these procedural noises. Now we saved out one of our own that was based off of, I think there's a Perlin noise. Or Perlin noise or something like that. So we'll just cancel this out and we'll load up the one that we kind of already have dialed in a little bit. So we'll say, let's load up our own expression, which was just noise anim. And again, it was just it was based off of one of those, um, one of those guys, one of those procedurals. And what we want to do is we want to go ahead and have this drive, and we'll drop that frequency down so that it's you know really pretty small. So where it's black again, it's going to be frame zero. And where it's white, we're going to get frame frame yeah. 15. And where it's anywhere in between those values, it's going to remap that range, essentially. So we'll accept that. So now that we have this frame map, what we're going to do is we're going to jump over to the primitives. And we're going to write an expression that, that ties this frame number into that map. And we've got this already saved out just to kind of speed things along here. So if we just say load expression, random number, um, oops, not random number, it was fit frame to 24. And, we actually want this to fit to frame 15 because yeah. we only have 15 frames of our animation mm -hmm. here. So essentially we're saying, what's, what, what, what's this expression doing here? It's actually saying, uh, taking the frame map expression is, is calling that. Uh, the output the, of that. The output of that. And then, which uh, as a float map, float expression is uh, 0 to 1. And it's saying, where it is 0, make it 1. And where it is 1, make it 15. And then anything in between that falls between the 1 and the 15. So it's basically saying, old men old max, new man, new max, yeah. essentially. So, and if you click on the swatch and you set your range from zero to 15, you can see if we put zero to one here and click on this, it's just all white. But if we put the range zero to 15, that's the output of the expression. So where yeah. it's white, the it's max 15. is 15. And where it's zero, it's, it's black. It's frame one, because you don't between. have a frame zero in the uh, animation, so. So pretty straightforward. So now we've got you know, some random to this guy. And so if we just jump over here and set this to be, I don't know, 
15 frames or something like that. And we go back to this expression and we just drop that contrast down to zero. We'll just set some keyframes on this just to get some movement in that, in that animation, you know, some movement across that, that fractal, that noise. Actually, it's not a fractal, so we'll put the contrast to a value of one. We'll say set key on that guy. So now if we hit playback on this, you can see that it's going to load this up. And, you know, based on the grayscale values of that texture map that's sort of just kind of swimming a little bit because we animated that contrast on and off, we now have these guys moving. So you could have an animated texture map passing through this yeah. or a noise pattern that is kind of swimming. So it's just a... Oh, you could set up a noise and you could put an offset on it so it actually moves the, the noise through space. So it looks like wind blowing across a hill or something yeah. like that. So it's just another example of how we can take um, expressions inside of XGen and do really, really fun things with them. In this example, referencing a frame number on an animation to make it look like and it's And you moving. could use a similar expression to drive rotations as well as that. So they'd be you know, whatever's driving the animation on the archive animation based on the frame, you could actually use a similar one to drive rotation. So they're not all facing the same way. And the, the ones that are facing this way are using uh, this frame. And ones that are facing that way are using that frame. So you can get incredibly complex and deep with uh, expressions in, in, in terms of layering on controls on top of controls. Yeah, it's super cool. So super you can cool. do a was... far deeper procedural kind of system than you, you think it is on first glance. But you can add all that after the fact. Yeah, I was psyched when it worked. Yeah. <laughs> when it works, yeah, it it's took a while. Good. <laughs> it was a lot better when it actually did work. Yeah, cool. All right, so the next example that we're going to look at is um, how we can randomly distribute different instance objects and, and kind of dial in how much of one we want versus right. how much of another we want. So we're going to open another file, and we'll get back to you in a couple seconds. All right, so in this last example, what we want to do is we want to get a little bit more control over the random distribution of these archives. So in this scene, we've got a bunch of X-Gen archives that are being loaded in for grass, weeds, crabgrass, dandelions, and the dandelion with the pollen. And by default, it's going to be randomly picking a number. This index number is going to be driving you know, sort of the distribution of those guys. Well, the, the pick is, uh, is weighted, but it's uh, weighted evenly, uh, depending on how many uh, are in the list. So each. Uh, object in the archive object in the list is going to get the same distribution weight. Okay. But you, you can uh, you can you can push the weight on that by adding uh, percentage values after the minus one. Uh, that you know, minus yeah you know, is minus one. You could uh, add but it, the percentages for each archive in the list, but it ha does have to add up to uh, one. Uh, right. Because if it goes past one, it will stop at one, and then the last one in the list no, won't get a percentage. We wouldn't get any dandelions with pollen. Yeah, if it didn't, if it added up to one, by the time it got to the third object in the list, uh, the the last one in the list would not get. All right. So I've already pasted some values in here that we kind of dialed in that we thought looked good. So essentially, we've got after the one, we're going to get 0.65, so 65% grass, um, 1.25 or 0.125, so 12% um, weeds, and then 10%. Uh, crabgrass, 10% dandelions, and 2% dandelions with pollen. So we don't want a lot of pollen in our scene. So you basically get your five numbers, they add up to a value of one, and that gives me the control exactly where I want it right. to adjust how many of each one of these uh, indexes we're going to get. So we'll go ahead and we'll hit the preview button on this. And you can see we have obviously now a lot more grass, a lot less uh, grass or dandelions uh, with pollen. So essentially it's giving me the distribution a little bit more like what I had intended. So yeah. it's a really simple example of how you can take you know, the, the expression that's there by default and just add you know, your own level of detail on top of it to, to manually drive the exact percentages of, of the distribution of those archives. So really cool example, totally showing the flexibility of XGen. And that's really what, uh, what all these videos were, were about. So thank you so much, uh, Michael, for taking the time to join us and, and go through all these. It, it, it's uh, been a pleasure. Well, you're welcome. And I always learn so much every time we're together. So it, it's been awesome. Hopefully everybody out there in the audience also was able to, uh, to gain a deeper knowledge of XGen and, and how, to, how to master its power from the guru, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Michael Todd. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Cheers, everyone.